All right. Well, welcome everybody. Let me just get this off my screen. Uh, welcome everyone to the Fallbrook Climate Action Team. We are a group, a nonpartisan group made up of volunteers concerned about climate change. And we hold a presentation with a different speaker on the last Thursday of every month. Uh, you can come join us live, or you can also listen to the recording of it by going on our website, which is fallbrookclimateactionteam.org, and you can pick up the recording there. And next month, we are going to be dark because it's December, we've got the holidays going on, so we'll be dark and won't have a presentation for December, but then in January, we're going to have the Solana Center speak about how to fight food waste and different ways to fight food waste. Um, and then we're also going to be starting right now the Cut the Carbon program, and I'll let Tim O'Leary talk about that. Hello. So the Cut the Carbon program has been going on for two years now. I think this we're entering our third year. And so it's starting up again. So people who are interested in participating, and that means paying $50 for a tree, and it gets you an, a year membership for the Land Conservancy. Um, and you also get to meet the legend, Jackie Heineman, who will come out to your house if you want. She can come out and tell you where to put the plant, the tree, what kind of tree to buy. But the part, Cut the Carbon program, which is put on by Save Our Forest and the FCAT team, is starting up again. So if you're interested in putting a tree on your property, give me a give me a uh, email. Email me, and I'll I'll send out an email link in in a minute. And maybe for the people, if they're watching um, the replay of this, it's Tim O'Leary X at gmail.com. X yeah, I'll, is a little X. But yeah, he'll put it in the chat for those who are on the call. So it's a great program and a great way to get the tree and also help out the land conservancy at the same time. So great program. And it gets Thank delivered. You, Kim. Uh, Jackie and I will deliver it to you. We pick it up and deliver oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, saves you a lot of time. And you get a good price because she, she negotiates with yeah. the nurseries and gets a really good discount usually yep. on the tree. Very good. Um, and then tonight, uh, we have Diane Kennedy, who's one of Fallbrook's own. Many of you may already be familiar with her. And I'm actually going to read off because she's got a pretty uh, good resume here. So let me just read it. She has an AA in landscape architecture, sustainable landscape and turf management, cert certificates in permaculture design irrigation, and is a quality water efficient landscaper. She is also co-leader of the Fallbrook Land Conservancy's Native Plant Restoration Team. And I believe you volunteer once a week on that, right, Diane? That's correct. Yeah, on a regular basis. As well as uh, she's been designing, consulting, writing, and lecturing about permaculture since 2011, so for quite a while. She gives ed educational tours through her permaculture food forest, which is called Finch Frolic Garden, and that's in Fallbrook. And she blogs about it on www.vegetariat.com. And we'll, I'll go ahead and throw that into the chat as well. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Diane. We're going to mute everybody. If you want, you can scroll down and uh, call up your chat function. Type in your question in the chat, that way you don't forget about it. And then at the end, when Diane is done going through her um, presentation, we'll unmute everyone and you have a chance to ask her question. Okay, so with that, Diane. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for, I saw a lot of names go up of people I know, that's fantastic. Um, water is a huge thing to worry about now, even though it just still comes out of our taps. People think, oh, we got plenty, but we don't. Um, so I'm going to um, show you a PowerPoint that I, I made up on, um, on water. So I'm going to share that right now, if everything works well. Here we go. 
Okay, doke. All right. So, um, uh, permaculture. So, what exactly is permaculture? It's uh, it's based on nature. It's kind of a portmanteau word that um, it stands for a lot of land use practices that are based on nature. Um, it is different from organic gardening because organic gardening is sustainable, which means we're keeping things the trying to keep things the same. Whereas permaculture is regenerative. We're trying to get better. It's not man versus nature, which organic gardening still is. It doesn't have a lot of inputs. It doesn't have a lot of work. It uh, doesn't have chemicals. Um, you're working with nature instead. And that sounds very new age and everything, but it's actually scientific. It's very practical. Um, it is, and then this is chemical free, not meaning all chemicals in the world, but man-made chemicals. So we don't use NPK fertilizer, that kind of thing. Um, it focuses on appropriate soil building. Permaculturalists are soil farmers first, and the plants come after that. So we build the appropriate soil for the appropriate plants. Like native plants don't want a lot of rich soil, but if you're growing apple trees, they do. Um, polyculture, um, a mixture of plants everywhere to um, that will not compete um, and will help each other to grow. And it includes habitat. So we're not um, getting rid of wildlife so that humans can, can live. We're working with them instead. So permaculture focuses on harvesting rainwater and storing it in the ground and in the vascular systems of plants. So, um, so permaculture, we just went through the what that, uh, engenders here. Um, it focuses on harvesting rainwater uh, um, into swales. This is a, a photo from um, somebody who's, who's on right now, um, one of our native plant restoration team members of her front yard where during that, uh, it's raining at this point, this is that two inch rain that we got. And she has rain catchment all throughout her, her yard. So that water is sinking in. Um, unfortunately, I have a lot of, uh, <laughs> um uh uh animations in here so let me move things around so almost all of southern california's landscapes are degraded um and one of the reasons is unrestricted grazing um that happened in the 1800s um if you've ever read the book um cattle on a thousand hills um uh by uh, mary campbell i believe it talks about just cattle everywhere and they ate everything down um, and still there's there's plenty of unrestricted grazing in areas um, overdevelopment can't say enough about that uh, the introduction of non-native invasive plants such as wild radish wild mustard pampas grass alyssum Bermuda grass, et cetera. So this is this is wild mustard. It's something that we target to get rid of everywhere. This is the brassica family, including alyssum. Um, they put out a substance through their roots that kill off the mycorrhizal fungi that native plants survive on. So if you have a, a hillside of native plants um, and some mustard gets in there or radish or this alyssum, um, which is a lot of wildflower mixes, um, it will sabotage other plants subterraneously, and then you'll have in a few years just a hillside of this plant, of any of the brassicas. So that's why when you throw out seed mixtures, the, um, the lysum comes up, the next year like, only the lysum comes up. <laughs> um, it's uh, sabotaging everything else, so we try to get rid of that. Um, degraded landscapes erode rather than harvest water. So if this the plants are gone off of this, water's pouring down, um, it's causing erosion channels through there, it's taking topsoil, it fills up during rainstorms, it fills the stream beds with, um, with um, soil. And then because the stream beds are now, uh, uh, the bottoms are rising up, there's less water, uh, eventually they disappear, and then shallow uh, rooted plants grow over the top of it. So we lose our fresh water sources. Um, successful restoration projects always include revegetation with native plants and the sinking of water and spreading it through the landscape. So 
if you want to see a, a wonderful YouTube video um, about this, uh, it's the Lessons of the Lust Plateau and by John D. Liu on YouTube. Um, this is a massive project that happened in China that um, with co controlling um, uh, grazing, um, re uh, harvesting rainwater and um, terracing and um, replanting, they've changed around their economy, they stopped dust storms, they have fresh water again, and it happened only in a handful of years that it happened. So it's, it's um, really inspirational to watch. So rainwater catchment. One inch of rain in an hour on an acre is 27,154 gallons of water. So even if we get, you know, drought year of 10 inches, that's well over 270,000 gallons of water that are falling on an acre uh, during that time. And the best place to hold that water is in the soil. So one way to do that is to make a swale. And a swale is a level bottomed ditch running perpendicular to water flow. So this is a cross section of it here. Um, this is one in actuality at um, Sky Mountain Permaculture in Escondido. So instead of water just ride, riding over the top soil, taking everything with it and, and silting up now water goes across the soil, it hits this ditch, it pacifies it, it spreads the whole length of that dish rather than making irrigation or erosion channels down here, it spreads it and then it percolates into the soil. It has this water plume that gradually moves through the soil. If you collect enough, if you have large enough swales, Within five to seven years, you are now contributing to the water table. This water moves slowly through the soil. And then months later, it then comes up in our stream beds, which have not been filled up with topsoil. And it keeps those alive during the summer, summer months. So it maintains and, and cleans water just by sinking. Um, swales are good for any slope that is, um, uh, less than 15%, um, because if you do it on too steep of a slope, you'll damage the integrity of that slope. Um, there, fortunately, a permaculture has put out a swale calculator. <laughs> so you don't have to memorize this, just Google swale calculator, and you can um, plug in your numbers and see if, if swales are, are, are good for your slope or if you need to terrace, um, and if, if you can use them, how many, how large and how distant apart they, they need to be. Um, my anime, all that animation I did last. Um, so um, one way to make a level bottom swale, um, because if it's tilted at the bottom, it's a gutter, it'll shoot water somewhere. Um, but you do it on contour. So these are contour lines across um, a map. These are level. But how you do that, you can, you can rent a, a laser level or you can make a bunyip. Um, and yes, permaculture is filled with amazing words. Um, bunyip is one of them. Um, it is a water level. This is my, my um, wonderful daughter, uh, Miranda, who's a um, co-conspirator of mine. Um, but it's basically two sticks with marked with inches along there or centimeters, wherever you want to do it, with clear tubing stretched between them, and it's filled with water. And you, one person stands on one side, one other person stands on another side, and you see where that water levels out. And then you put um, flags in and you know that that area is level and you can dig between them. So this is our native plant restoration team from a few years back, um, digging swales out at Los Hilgueros. Um, so water's flowing in from the pathway, it sinks into here and then moves slowly through the landscape down into the subterranean area there. Um, this is erosion. Um, everybody's familiar with this. This is Sky Mountain Permaculture in, um, in Escondido. Um, water's coming off the street and just eroding like crazy. And there's so much water that comes through. 
Um, now, Sky Mountain was planted up as a food forest, and then the Cocoa Fire went through and burned it down, um, including one of the houses that was there. They, they had moments to, to get out of it. And then the fire swept through and then died <laughs> after taking the house down. So irony there. But this was a, um, afterwards, a lot of friends um, and permaculturists came out and were um, cleaning up after the fire, but we dug these big swales across the property. Um, and then um, this is after restoration. This is after, this is about a year and a half afterwards. So all these swales collected all of that water. So that water is flowing in from the street. It was guided through here. These all swales have designated, oh, designated overflows that go flow into the next one and into the next one, and then they sink down. And then it was revegetated with um, native um, lupin and, and California poppy, and then planted with trees. And now it's a food forest again that harvests thousands and thousands of gallons of water um, uh, every rainstorm when it comes through. There's no more erosion left in there. So if even if, you know, the huge swales are wonderful, but if you don't have a lot of property, um, you can do swales anywhere. So here swales can be dug with a shovel. Again, this is our uh, native plant restoration team at Los Algueros um, taking water and you can do it shovel wide, shovel deep, just as long as the water sinks in. Um, this is um, again from my friend who has um, who is digging what's called fish scale swales. So the water flows this way down the property, um, and she has an existing grove. So she dug these fish scale swales, and she did this during the summer with a pickaxe. <laughs> um, so water flowing down now hits, pacifies sinks in and then that water goes down and irrigates the roots of these trees um, rather than um, passing around these trees and just flowing onto the street. Um, I've changed irrigation so that it waters into these swales and rather than spraying all around in conjunction with mulch, um, it you now use 100% of, of your irrigation. Um, rain catchment basins, and I have these at my property because the property was eroded from so many years of water flowing in from the street that it's bowed out in the middle and you can't do a swale without digging very, very deeply on the side to make it level. So instead, water flows in from the street and then comes to this rain catchment basin. So Roger Bodart, um, was, um, who's, who's on tonight, um, was a person that I contacted when I first wanted to install the garden. Um, and gave him a whole bunch of permaculture books and said, I need a food forest. Um, and one of the big projects was making these rain catchment basins would solve the uh, erosion problem there. So this water comes into this area. These are our, our stepping stones across there. This is that area um, through that last rain. This is um, this rock here. Or no, this is this, is this rock right here. So... Um, Massive amounts of water comes in off of Vista del Indio and even Alvarado and then and through and then so this fills up and then it pacifies and then it overflows into it, a smaller one and another one and another one all the way throughout the property. So we harvest again, uh, not only every drop that falls on our property or acre and a half, but we harvest hundreds of thousands of gallons that come from the neighbors. This is also uh, silt base and there's silt deposition in here. So we get the neighbor's topsoil too. So um, we dig that out and we use it um, uh, elsewhere on our, our clay soil. So another way to harvest water are functional dry stream bed, bread, beds. Um, so a lot of dry stream beds I see are ornamental or they're made to gutter water away from the property into the street. But if you do it on contour, and do it level at the bottom, they're not only very lovely and um, architecturally pretty um, and planted, but they harvest water now too and sink it safely away from your house. Um, at this, uh, this is one of my clients. 
down here, they have one that goes all the way along here and this really cute dog. Um, and then they wanted a permanent pond too. So the pond is here separate from the rain catchment because you never wanna put a pond where there's going to be seasonal water flow. It'll just wash out. Um, so this, this, is, this stays and then this fills up with water that comes off of this um, watershed um, seasonally. Um, here's another one that was done from another client. Um, their house is right here, and this is taking gutter water and um, sinking it in far enough away from their embankment where it won't damage their slope, but that moves slowly down and waters the um, erosion control plants we put on that slope. Um, now, the County of San Diego is offering rebates for water capture, um, and they're good rebates. And there's there's a there's a whole variety of rebates they're they're offering. But if you put in new gutters um, and sink that water safely, um, you get you get money back for it. So these are some projects that I, I've done this year. Um, and this one um, here, the gutter will, comes down and it goes underground under this mulch and then feeds into this rain catchment basin, which is actually linked to a dry stream bed. And it's all planted all the way around. These plants were just put in the ground here. Um, so it's extremely functional. It's taking the, the um, gutter water and depositing it safely away from the foundation of the, of the house and sinking it in so everything, all the trees and everything can get that water. Um, this, you may not see anything. There's a six foot wide by three foot deep, huge pit here. <laughs> and this is all gutter water coming off of most of the half of a house. So um, it, the only reason it's filled up with mulch is so that people don't fall into it like a big bear trap. Um, the mulch isn't necessary to be in there, um, otherwise for safety, but it's filled up with mulch. So now all of that water that's pouring off that roof sinks safely away from the house down very deeply. And there's plants around here and then that moves through the soil away from it. Um, here is a gutter and um, it's feeding into a smaller, since this is just taking a small portion of the house water uh, from the roof um, and feeding it into a long basin out here. And then after this, the lawn was um, completely mulched. So the, you don't even see the, the mulch on there, but it's, it's working. Eventually that mulch decomposes and, and it sinks in a little bit. And that's fine, you just keep topping it up. And then after, I don't know, five, six years or so, you can dig out amazing mulch out of it and use it somewhere else and put some fresh stuff in there. Um, and you want mulch, you want big chunk bark if you can, the bigger stuff, the better. You've heard the word bioswales a lot. Um, and that's pretty much a, something that is done um, by government agencies and uh, regulated for public areas. It takes a lot of, um, infrastructure for those with drains and a lot of gravel and other things in there. Um, and it, it's, it's rather expensive. You don't have to do that. You can just dig a hole and let the water go into it. Please, please, please don't use gravel. Uh, it's impossible to get out of the ground. It is reflects heat. It, it destroys soil, it turns soil into dirt. Um, it gets loaded with with silt and it's impossible to clean. So it looks awful. The weeds come up through it. Um, it's just not a good material for, for soil building or for rain capture. Um, the larger your stones, the larger the rocks, the, the, the better they are. So the fire department says that within, with next year, they're going to regulate that there should be a five foot safety zone around your house without any combustible materials. Also, um, there is legislation that insurance companies can need to give you a deal um, if you have taken steps to fire proof or fire, um, reduce the fire hazard around your house. So if you use like large beach stones and other rocks within five feet of your house and plant succulents in there and nothing combustible that can go up and, and light up your, your wooden overhang. Um, it's lovely. It doesn't heat up. Um, bigger, bigger rocks don't. They're not so much of a thermal mass. Um, and you can um, gutter water away from that too. 
here is another fun term. It's called Hugel culture. Um, and it's basically just dirt on wood. And yes, this does look like a torso. It's not. It's a coral tree. Um, it looks like a belly button and some legs cut off there. We, you know. Um, anyway, um, so you 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 put you put wood into the ground and you cover it up with dirt and you put some more wood and cover it up with dirt. So the dirt is covering everything. Um, and you often do that in conjunction with a swale. So here's a swale that water comes from here and flows into. This is all hugel culture. So that water moves through the soil. And then as this wood ages, it becomes a sponge and it holds onto that water in the soil. And then when the ground around it dries out, that water is wicked into the soil. So you can plant on the downward side of this. And also, it sequesters carbon because um, wood above ground, um, cut wood, releases carbon to the atmosphere, which is part of global warming. But as soon as you cover up with dirt, it sequesters that carbon in a usable form for plants. Um, it's also slowly slow release fertilizer. It, is, it decomposes, it slowly adds to the, the beneficial fungus in the soil. So when you chop down a tree, you can mulch it for the soil um, or you can bury it. And all those plants that have prickers all over them, the bougainvillea and the lime trees and the roses and everything, instead of being stabbed and jamming it into your, your green waste, dig a little hole, throw it in, cover it up. It's, it, it does not enough to hold water, but all of that buried organic material will build soil. Um, so you can also catch in rain tanks. One inch of rain on a thousand square foot roof is 637 gallons of water. So when you set up a few 50 gallon containers, they're going to overflow within a couple of minutes. So make sure that you have um, the overflow from those facing away from your house or into a swale or into a rain catchment basin or something so that you don't just have flooding um, right up against your house. If you go large, um, if you have a big tank like this, um, please make sure it's level on the bottom because if it's not, it will torque and it will leak. And it can, if it's one of the tall ones, then it... Um, become hazards to your house. I've, I've seen many instances of these in clients' houses where um, they need to suddenly have to empty, you know, a, a thousand gallon tank because the thing is, is, is lopsided. Um, you can also bury um, tanks and, and pump water out of that. Um, but again, this is only gonna handle a fraction of the amount of water that comes off of your roof. So be prepared to take that overflow and, and sink it somewhere. Now, if you have, this is a house, and if you have a above ground um, water tank, you can put it anywhere you want on your property and you can put this pipe underground as long as the, where the, the, it's coming from the gutter is higher than the input on your, on your, your water basin. Um, so you can have this underground, you know, for half an acre if you wanted to, and it will fill up that tank as long as the top of this tank is lower than the, um, the, the top of the, or the bottom of that gutter there. Pretty tricky. Physics is amazing. So sinking water and gray water also hydrates the landscape and to keep plants healthy and more fire resistant. Um, a lot of people hear about clearance and seeing, think that means no plants, um, no nothing on the ground, no leaves, no anything. Absolutely not. If you have bare ground and you have a fire that's going to blow those ashes and those leaves and everything on fire right up to the first thing it hits uh, to stop it, and that's going to be your house rather than hydrated landscape. Um, so by sinking water, you have healthier trees. They have deeper roots because those roots follow that water down into the soil. Um, with native and Mediterranean landscapes, they require a fraction of the water that other landscapes need to be hydrated. So if you notice in this with this little rock and roll guy there, um, 
that all these planting areas here are actually sunken below the pathway. Raised mounds are for getting rid of water. That's an East Coast landscape thing where they have to get rid of water. We need to soak it. So we try to make pathways higher than the surrounding areas so that the water sinks in. Um, every drop counts. It also holds the coolness a little bit more. So that helps um, with the health of the plants as well. Um, here's um, a little curb cutting. Um, um, water's flowing down the street in Escondido. This is by Alden Hoff, who is Sky Mountain Permaculture. He's a, an amazing um, water catchment um, engineer. Um, but water's coming down. So he cut the curb and he put some pipes in. It's all covered with mulch. And this is the other side of it. You see that water being delivered into a big rain catchment. So without having to do anything else, a lot of this water is now going in here and sinking into this property and then down through that property. So um, if you read any Brad Lancaster books, he's the a person who um, has written a lot of books about um, uh, harvesting water from the streets and curb cutting. He just went ahead and did it and soaked water in um, kind of gorilla, gorilla water catchment in, in Arizona. Uh, and finally legislation ca caught up with them and they changed the legislation. So now they all capture water off the streets because they have healthy plants in between. So, so these are other erosion control methods and these can be used with huge erosion issues or just small ones. It's, this, it's like permaculture. It can be done on huge properties or can be done if you have pots on a balcony, um, any size. So this one is called one rock dams. And this is when you have um, an erosion area where water has just really worn down this area. You put in a layer of rocks, one layer of rocks, you key it into the side a little bit, it's bowed in the middle. And then the water during a rain event will come through. And here's an overview. This is a top view of the same thing. The water will come in and they'll hit these one rock dams and we'll start de de depositing silt. Um, there'll be depositions in the middle here. Here's a cross view of that. So after um, a, a few rain events, this, the silt will have deposited itself behind these. And then you build another one rock dam on top of that. And then more silt comes in and deposits behind that until you finally you get to the soil surface and then water can now, it's the, the erosion has healed itself and it can spread throughout the landscape and soak in in, instead. And always do it dipped rather than flat because flat will cause that water to cut into the sides. Whereas this, it's going down the middle and those rocks are slowing it and causing the silt to back up behind it. So cool. Um, there's um, some great YouTube videos by Bill Zydek um, and others, but uh, they show um, building these um, out in big um, erosion cuts um, um, out in, in desert areas. Um, a Zuni bowl, these are often also done with zuni bowls. Sounds like something you order with has quinoa in it um, and some berries maybe. Um, but these are just basically rock line basins that where there's a discharge where that water pours through, it's going to keep cutting and cutting and cutting. So instead you do this little bowl with um, and you fill it with rock, not gravel, you fill it with the local rock, and then you have a one rock dam on there. So this water that's coming through the, the pipe now is not um, digging deeper, it hits this, this is a buffer zone, um, it's a plunge pool, and then the water, the silt deposits behind this um, one rock dam and goes on um, from there. So um, here's a a little side issue, side um, vi uh, visual here of it hitting and then going and then and going through um, around. So there's a splash apron, so you're not causing more more issues. Um, I, I told you they have great names. Media Luna, Media Luna is just 
just and this this is a, at a property uh, a client of mine who has a ton of rocks and this is water just flowing off of his driveway that comes down through here so we did several of these a media luna is just a crescent moon so we have a, a erosion coming through it hits and then it it hits these rocks and then it diffuses and then it slowly sinks in after that you don't have an erosion channel any longer so this is now water's coming down it's hitting this it's slowing it it's pacifying it it's coming through in gentler form and then it hits another one down here and just sinks into the landscape and you can plant on this 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 they just had they they were just dumping these rocks when um i took this photo um but it can look beautiful it can look fine you you can you know, plant in and around this and that'll only help with the um the water harvesting so um let me get that out of the way because this was one of those really complicated animations that i spent a lot of time on um all right um this is at a um uh right down the street from me uh, neighbors two neighbors here they left it go to weeds they spray roundup all over it um and then it, the water erodes and it's just going into this asphalt area which is of course cracking that's asphalt is um um subsidence going on there whereas this neighbor um who is also one of my clients um i suggested they put mulch on it plant some succulents and they they listen to me which is always such a nice thing and um so no weeds looks lovely water sinks into the ground now it's building soil it it's you know it's a big solution so mulch just just do mulch <laughs> mulch is so important um this is, let me see if I can make this more clear. Um, this is sheet mulch. And that's when you put a layer of newspaper cardboard right on top of your weeds and then cover it up with mulch, uh, several inches of mulch. Um, and that will suppress the weeds, it'll stop um, the deoxygenation of the ground, it'll stop compaction. And when you stop compaction, you have water sinkage and water retention. And also mulch itself will help break up water and send it sinking into the ground rather than um, um, causing it to um, harden. The rainwater irrigation falling on bare ground is as compacting as driving a tractor over the top of it. So, and that you use more and more water because the water's rolling off or burning off. So that sheet mulch, um, or you can just use mulch itself. And this is mulch that is around a fruit tree at um, another client and friend. A lot of my clients are friends um, in that order, which is wonderful. Um, so making sure the mulch does not touch the trunk of the tree, you don't want to the rot, but several inches of mulch around it. With every inch of mulch, you reduce your watering by 10%. And so make sure you're not overwatering your trees. And mulch should be at least two inches thick. If it's too little, it dries out the soil. So if you mulched like a year ago, and now you can see dirt in between, that little, those little chips of bark are now heating up and sucking moisture out. So if two, at least two inches of mulch on the ground in the middle of August, you should be able to stick your finger at the bottom of that. And, um, it should be moist and um, and cool um, down there. And lastly, um, check your irrigation. Um, I, I go to two or three consultations a week. I have a lot of clients and just about every pro most plant problems I find having to do with too much or too little irrigation or broken irrigation. Um, so go out there and look at it, turn it on and look at it and see if there's geysers, see if there's dry spots, seeing if something's come apart, see if things are clogged. We have a high mineral water and it clogs up those nozzles. So you do need to go clean them up a little bit. Um, 
And symptoms of overwatering are mostly the same as for underwatering. So if you look at a plant and it's wilting, don't just go, oh, it needs some more water, particularly if it's a drought tolerant plant or a native. Um, the best water gauge you have is on your hand. It's one of your fingers. <laughs> Stick that in the ground. And if three inches down, you'd get, it's, it's, it's moist, don't water. <laughs> um, moisture meters fail over time. So they give you inaccurate readings. So, so use your observational skills and, and, and stick your finger in the ground and see what it's like. Unless a plant has a small root ball, like um, you know, vegetables or newly planted plants, most plants want deep watering less frequently. There were so many groves where they're watering those trees for maybe 15 minutes, three and four times a week. Um, the fruit doesn't taste good. Um, it, there's weeds everywhere. The leaves are yellowing. Um, it's all because those shallow root basins on the citrus and, and subtropicals are being washed away, all the minerals. So water deeply and water maybe once a week until it's summertime and then maybe twice a week if it's really hot in conjunction with mulch around the base of those trees. Um, broken or maladjusted irrigation, overwatering, overspray, which is where the water is hitting the sidewalk and rolling down the street, and overhead sprayers just make your water bill so high and they waste so much water. Um, Drip irrigation, such as Netafim or other perforated hoses, clog easily and are damaged really quickly. I had a nightmare with Netafim here. Where they was always clogging underground or animals were chewing it up and there were areas that were, were flooding and other areas that are drying up. Um, and so we, we switched to above ground PVC covered with mulch and then these heads. And I'll get to those in just a second. But if you have, um, if you have, if you cannot check your irrigation, then hire a, a quell quality water efficient landscaper certified irrigation specialist, and they'll do an evaluation of your irrigation. So I use um, now PVC with this is either a spectrum head, which makes a, just a little um, like a little um, uh, ball uh, of water coming out, and these are the the wonderfully named shrublers, um, which are little sprayers like this. Um, so this I use around trees. These are on what's called street 90s. They're both, they're screwed in together. So this will actually turn in 360 degrees. So I can put this down next to a newly planted plant. And then as the plant root grows, I can now move it away without disturbing all of this. Um, this is attached to black tubing. These are spaghetti strands on black tubing that is snaked around and under, um, under mulch as well. These are so easy to move around. They're so easy to clean. They're so easy to fix. Um, and they are not spraying water all over the weeds. They are delivering um, a, a certain amount of water um, directly into the ground around your trees. In conjunction with mulch, you are now using 100% of the water that you are, are putting on the ground. So anyway, there's um, a lot more information. I've been blogging for a long time uh, at vegetarian.com. Um, I have a, a page that says resources, and I've listed a, a bunch of permaculture books and other books that I've vetted. Um, I'm, there's many more I haven't gotten to, but I'm not going to promote something just because it has the word permaculture um, in it. Um, also, we have a Finch Frolic Garden YouTube channel where I've bookmarked amazing permaculturalists doing all kinds of things with um, lecturing about um, water, lecturing about uh, just about anything. And I'm not supported by, by any Thing. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm a rogue and a terrible businesswoman, so um, I don't promote anything except for permaculture on itself. So I'm not sponsored by by anybody. Um, so I will switch back here, um, and um, uh, hopefully you um, I, I you I, I have stopped the share, and hopefully that worked, and um, we can be open for some questions if you'd like. 
Yeah, we have, um, can we take everyone off mute or Cynthia, if you wanna take yourself off? Okay. I had a real simple question. Um, okay. Uh, actually, let me see here. What is um, a food forest? Oh, good question. Okay, a food forest is a collection of plants. So, so all plants do many things, but often they have one particular function, a canopy or subcanopy, or they, they set nitrogen in the soil. They have deep tap roots that mine nutrients up from the bottom. They're vining plants or they're, they sprawl and cover the ground. So understanding that template because that's how plants arrange themselves in nature so that they are actually helping each other grow. Um, understanding that template, then you substitute in um, plants that you want. So fruit trees, nut trees, um, medicinal plants, culinary plants, um, ornamentals that you particularly like, but with those plants that, that, that do that function. So a food forest is a collection of plants that um, are arranged in ways that they help each other grow to grow with saving water and with no fertilizer, um, and um, um, but yet provide you with the food that you you want to eat. So I have um, a food forest, and I've planted a lot of food forests and um, guided people in theirs too. So it's. It's um, it acts like a forest, but you get to to pick the plants that you put in there. Thank that you. Helps. Okay, certainly, certainly. And let's see, we have another question from Cullen. If you want to take yourself off mute. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Um, can you review how to level the bottom of a swale? Oh yeah, certainly. So um, uh, if. If it's just a short swale, then you can just use a level and put it at the bottom and just dig it. Um, but if you're doing a larger swale, then um, you want to run a contour um, around your property. And um, the, the thing that I showed was a, called a bunyip, um, which is a water level. And you can use a laser level as well, you know, rent that. But um, the bunyip is... Um, the and I, I have this on my blog, so you can you can Google or, or search for on my blog uh, B U N Y I P, and I'll show you how to uh, to create one on there. Um, it's two sticks with um, inches um, uh, marked on there, and then um, a, a clear tubing stretched between, and is filled with water. So one person gets on one side, and one other person gets the other and they see where the level of the water is. And if one's higher than the other, then one has to move until it gets level. And then they know that those two places are level. And the beauty of that too, is that the, 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 the tubing doesn't have to be taut. You, it can lay all over the ground and work. You can do it around corners. You can use it for slopes. You can use it for measuring um, for stairs. It's, it's a, just a really cheap and easy water level that you can make at home and, and pull out and, um, and use. Does that help? Yeah, that was helpful. I had one more question too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you re recommend, we were talking about um, uh, sprayers earlier for watering. Do you recommend a quarter inch drip line? Um, do you mean um, for, for drip line with the, with the stuff with the holes in it? Yes. That you're talking about? No. <laughs> and for the same reason, because we have this high mineral. I mean, you know, look, in, look inside your pipes in your shower and see that goop in there. That's what's also going through your, um, your irrigation. For like a vegetable garden, yeah, maybe. But for most plants, especially drought tolerant plants and native plants, the drip irrigation is really, really bad for them. Not only does the thing clog so that you can't, you can't determine what's getting water when, and it's virtually impossible to clean out, um, but also it just, it spoots out a little bit, of, that's the technical term, um, a little bit of water at a time. And native plants and Mediterranean plants want a good drink um, where the water flushes through the soil and moves on. And then a time in between where it dries out and the oxygen can get back into the soil. So drip irrigation is really, you know, it sounds really marvelous, but it, it, it's so bad for, it's a killer for native plants. 
and a lot of our Mediterranean plants. Um, for vegetables that need water all the time, that's fine. So yeah, that's and it's the same as Netafim. It's the same with soaker hoses. Um, for big landscape, they'll go bad on you really, really well. So that's why I, you know, promote something that has a little bit larger holes that delivers water all at once, and you shut it off and you let that that soil um, get oxygen back into it again. Mm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I've I've lived through it. <laughs> <laughs> can I okay, can I ask one more question? Of course. Sorry to hog you. No, uh, not at all. But it caught my attention when you said well, you were talking about citrus and watering citrus deep deeply. Yes. And like once a week, something like that. What do you mean by deeply? Like, do you? dig a hole to get it in there deeply or what do you mean by that? Um, it means a lot of water at once um, so that the water sinks in through the soil. And you can do that in conjunction with those fish scale swales like I showed you too. But um, citrus and subtropicals, their, their, their roots only go down about 18 inches. All their feeder roots are right up against the soil surface. Mm -hmm. And where they come from, they completely cover the ground so that the, 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 a lot of rain that, that they, those areas get aren't pounding on those feeder roots mm -hmm. and um, aren't washing away the minerals. And then they've, they've covered their feeder roots with a, a ton of leaves and old fruit, and that's what feeds them. Um, so we've got them all pruned up and the sun hits and we rake them all out and, and there's grass growing and the sprinklers hitting the trunk and rotting the trunk. And the trees are really stressed. So we mulch around there and then we give it a, a, a long drink that soaks through the ground rather than just wetting the top of it. Yeah. Um, so it sinks down through you know several inches of water. And then you give it a break um, so that the soil has a chance to, that water has a chance to move through the soil and oxygen can get back into it again. Um, so um, in a lot of cases, depending on your, how heavy your soil is, sometimes you only need to water them once until it gets once a week until, you know, it starts getting, um, depending on the size of the, it's depending on a lot of things, the size of the plant, where you live, which slope it's on. Um, but, um, you know, and then, you know, really the maximum of twice a week during the summertime rather than three or four times a week. Wow. And again, you use your <laughs> use your, your homemade water tester to <laughs> stick your hand, finger in the ground. And if it's damp three inches down, don't water it. <laughs> Such this good works. information. I swear, I probably would have killed our orange tree that we just bought. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's little. So, but we're you know, so little earth root balls need a little bit more frequent water because they need to, um, and, and make sure the the water is away from that root ball so that it's not just it, it, so, so those roots will get to it. But we also have short cool days and possible rain. So yeah, just just test it. Make sure you mulch it when you plant a tree. Soak that hole as often as possible and then plant the tree and drown that plant. And that's mm -hmm. the best watering that plant can ever get. And then, um, and then back off and let it dry out in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, oh, thank you so much for all that info. You're welcome. Diane, do, do, does it matter if you have like two inches or three inches of mulch on the tree? Do, do you have to water underneath the mulch or you can just water the mulch? It'll permeate down, right? Yeah, you want to, you can, especially with salty water, like if you have a well um, and you, um, and, and high mineral waters, you absolutely can water through that mulch. Um, um, it will, it will sink down through that and that mulch and that, or the leaves uh, will create a humic acid, which helps clean out the chemicals that are in the water and help diffuse a lot of that salt. So when we get salt burn on avocados, um, uh, from our water, if we water through mulch, thick mulch instead, you'll get less of a salt burn because that mm. mulch helps moderate um, the salt that's in there. You don't have to do this massive flushing um, and waste water and cause a, a, a salt layer to develop in the soil. Um, so, um, so yes, you can water through mulch. 
or you can water in a rain catchment, you know, swale and in conjunction with mulch around the base of the tree. So. And how far, when you do the rain catchment swale, how far away from the tree? I guess it depends on the slope and how it moves. The drip line. How gravity moves. Right at the drip line. Right at the drip, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Uh, I see two raised hands. Bill, did you type that in? Yes. Uh, oh, I, I'm not seeing the hands. hands. <laughs> Tim, why don't you unmute yourself? Hey, uh, thanks for a very careful, interesting talk. Uh, you clearly have put a lot of effort over the years, so I appreciate it. Um, I have a question about commercial property. There's a lot of building going on. Uh, I was uh, up in Valley Center. There's a new um, housing complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, here, uh, I'm down in Del Mar going up on Manchester into es uh, Encinitas mm -hmm. on El Camino Real. Um, mm -hmm. they, just, they just kind of whopped a whole section out of a mountain yeah uh, mound and they put up a wall of of concrete and uh it doesn't see you mentioned codes for fire protection but i don't see much uh attention paid they're putting these big buildings right to the property lines uh and and thinking about the future of uh, trying to get that under control may may help some uh just as an aside i'm trying to get a preserve here by the san diego lagoon uh, okay. which they're they're double tracking and doing some other things uh but our our kind of mountain is waterlogged there's a mm -hmm. lot of water comes down from delmar heights area and uh some of the uh the bluff uh, fell down and it's really really waterlogged mm -hmm. and so we kind of have the opposite problem of too much water but uh nobody seems to be paying attention to that and the conversion of these natural areas which have already been devastated just seems to going to be make it worse and i was wondering if you had any ideas yeah the the the, the water logging is because of the development and the, the lack of plants so the vascular system of plants holds a lot of water so if you have a lot of trees and a lot of shrubs that's holding a lot of water um, and holding um, the, um, the soil as well. But um, the, the water that's, that's, that's wrecking these bluffs is, at a, is not sunk very deeply as up, uphill. It's being shed off of streets and off of these new developments and, and into, um, into, way, into soil that has been weakened because of being graded and, and um, having, having houses built on it and um, uh, being compacted. And then also the lack of plants. So we're, we're losing our treescape because um, a lot of the plants that were successful during our like 70, 80 years of um, abnormally high rainwater that we, we thought was normal, but was not, um, all those Christmas trees that were planted out there are all dying off because of the lack of water table now. Um, places are smaller. They, people don't want a huge um, landscape um, around their, their property. They, so they have bigger houses and less property. So you can't have trees in there. Um, fire, you can't have a big tree next to your house or for fire issues. So we're, we're losing our treescape. When you look at a tree, you're looking only at 40% of that tree. 60% of that tree is underground. So that's that, wrap your mind around that when you look at, you know, look at a pine tree. 60% of that tree is underground and that's roots. So when you have smaller trees, you don't have that root base and you don't have, uh, and you just have shrubs, you certainly don't have that root base. You don't have that holding um, the soil and you certainly don't having that vascular system holding water. So the water that's going through those bluffs and out is just being shed because of all that development and because of the denuding of the landscape all the way up, up uphill from that. So, um, um, and yeah, what can you do you just can keep, keep trying to talk about sinking water responsibly rather than sending it all down off of hardscape. So 
um, and, and just trying to plant um, regenerate um, regenerate areas as much as possible with native plants. So, yeah. So, yeah, I I vote against the developments. I lecture. <laughs> I, I do what I can, but um, I know it's it's a sorry thing here. Um, but the the more plants we can get in, particularly the more native plants, um, uh, the better. So. I don't know if I addressed your your comment well enough there, but that's no, no, I you know, and and how to because it has some details and as you said, some physics, and particularly hydro physics, yes, um, and, and the properties of uh, of mulch breaking down and why that's good. We we I, just as an aside, I don't mean to take up too much time, but we have a lawn that's sprinklered, and mm -hmm. uh, we're up on the hill. Uh, uh, right near that area by the ocean. And the problem is that when the wind blows from the mountains, it dries everything out. When it comes in the other direction, everything's too moist. It yeah. turned out the sprinkler system we were using was only watering to maybe six, not even six inches. And half of it was running off, uh, you know, into the street and under the street. Yeah. And so the slower uh, percolation uh, systems it really cut down maybe about 50% of the water use and, and yeah. the grass liked it better. But a lot of people are using using the high water to wash the salt out that's in the uh, the water supply. So it's kind of, know. you know. And that's, that's what I'm talking about, the mulch. So you, mulch will clean stuff up. And those MP rotators from Hunter are the ones that deliver, the, the sprinkler heads that deliver a slower stream of water. You water longer and you still save money um, because they're delivering deliberate streams. They're not, they're not spraying um, and misting all over the place. Yeah. There's also ways to care for, if you do have to have lawn, there are ways to care for a lawn that save water. Um, and I've got that on my blog too. Um, if, you, if, you Google, if you search on my blog under lawn. So yeah, okay, thank you. And then uh, the final hand up, and then we'll go ahead and cut it off there. We'll take this as our last question. Kat Donnelly. Hi. So thank you so much for this webinar. I've been to many, many, many regeneration and permaculture, and this was by far the most pragmatic thing for us because we have, you know, we have an acre of land in Fallbrook. We bought it 18 months ago. It was dirt, not soil when we got here and we've been trying to regenerate it. And I won't go into too much detail, but I have three specific questions that we have searched and searched for answers for. Um, one is where might we find indigenous microorganisms? So IMOs, so that we can, you know, bring some of the life back to the soil. Two, what are the best local indigenous cover crops. We, have, we do have a lot of succulents that we're spreading all around and trying to get rid of the ice plant um, and the grasses. Um, and then three, my understanding is that mulch brown and green are different, like the one's bacterial and one is fungal and that different things like, so I'm wondering for your trees, is there one color mulch to do? And for the like grounds and the water catchment things, is it a different color mulch okay and that might be too much but, see if yeah. i work backwards so i can because i've probably forgotten what the first one was um but um the uh so mulch is chipped up bark it's dead stuff mostly um the you can use chipped up green stuff however the chipped up green stuff it still needs to decompose so it will rob nitrogen out of the soil so until it gets to a brown state um, because it's hot, it's full of nitrogen yet. The brown stuff, the, the bark um, is dead. And so it's, it's, um, it, it, it doesn't have that. It, it's, it's a fung the fungal activity will start in there in decomposition. So if you have chipped up green stuff, then you can use it in a compost heap to, as, your, as your, your green versus the brown, or if you wanna use it on the ground, use it on something you wanna burn like weeds um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but the, the dead stuff, the, the older bark, you can um, use around the, the base of your trees. Or you can also use sheet mulch. So if you use a layer of newspaper cardboard and then put the mulch on top of that, even if it does have some green properties, it's, it will, by the time 
the newspaper you know decomposes enough where the mulch touches the ground, it should have the uh, uh, turned brown and and not had that, that issue. Um, um, the soil micro, micro microorganisms. Um, we're in a special chaparral area. Um, our soil micro, I, my, microbes are actually at the soil surface. When you're taking a hike and you see some green off to the sides on the ground, that's our crypto crust. It can be broken with a footfall. That's why it's so important not to cut trails um, because we don't have a deep soil profile here. There may not have been a native earthworm to Southern California because um, we didn't need them. Um, so um, when you plant natives, um, if you get them from a reliable um, seller like Moosa Creek Native Plant Nursery or like Tree of Life, um, they create their own soil. So they are full of the native microbes. So when you plant that plant, you are um, inoculating the soil as you go and you don't need to do anything else. You, you mulch around it just for the first year because you don't want a, um, a rich soil um, around native and Mediterranean plants. Um, just you want them to cool, keep the roots cool and keep the weeds down the first year and let them water saturate um, in there. Um, but if you're building soil, for fruit trees or any other production things, they come from different types of, of, of soil. So that's where you add organic material to the soil, whether it be compost, um, whether it be worm castings, whether it be kelp, um, whether it be, um, if you need to, the only product that I have seen that I, and I'm sure there's more out there, but Dr. Earth, and again, I'm not supported by them, but they actually have microbes and microbial food. It's not a concentrated NPK um, fertilizer, um, just as a starter um, to get your soil going um, around those, those plants. Um, blender compost, where you take a handful of your kitchen scraps and put it in your blender, fill it up with water, liquefy it, pour that around the drip line of your fruit trees once a month. Um, that feeding the soil microbes in there. So you're getting more organic material into the soil around the fruit trees and you're building that soil up around them. But for native and Mediterranean, they just want what's here already. So, and then there was a third question. I can't remember what it was. What was cover it? Cover crops. Like, are there local cover crops here at Fallbrook? Okay, yeah. The only reason you'd use a cover crop um, really is to, um, if you're going to grow a crop. Um, because cover crops need so much water. Mm -hmm. um, so any, so clover or peas or any of that kind of stuff, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do that on a broad scale. Um, if you are like, you're trying to regenerate, like I showed the slide of um, Sky, Sky Mountain. Um, he threw out um, native annuals, lupin and uh, California poppy, to, so those roots would hold that area since the fire had gone through and then other plants emerged through that. Um, yeah. So really, mulch is really the best thing um, on the soil rather than doing a cover crop and then turning it under or, or, um, um, or mowing it or, or other things. Um, you can certainly grow nitrogen fixing plants around the, the, the food bearing plants that need um, more uh, uh, nutrition in the soil. We do that all the time. We have this is part of the food forest is having that collection of plants in there. And then we also have grow some things that are nitrogen fixing that are chop and drop like um, the senna or the cassia, the, um, the, the popcorn cassia. Um, it, um, you see it along roadsides. It has the yellow, yellow bloom on it. Um, but you, we grow it, we chop it, let that fall to the ground as, as green mulch. It reduces some of the roots. The roots have nitrogen nodules on it. It releases, recharges a little bit of nitrogen in the soil. Plant grows back up again. So we use those type of plants for recharging our, our soil um, or growing peas and beans out in the field too and then getting a crop off of them and then cutting them back. So, so a cover crop for, for, for 
for planting trees and such. It just, it's not feasible water-wise here and because of our weeds and everything. Um, so many weeds come up in between it. It's just, it's not, it's not feasible. Um, but um, you can also, if you're, if you're going to be planting trees, um, then you can make a movable compost heap. You can set up a compost bin out where you're going to plant and throw, throw your greens and browns in there and let it rot down you know, for a month or so and then move it to the next place where you're gonna plant a tree. The best soil on your property is under your compost heap. So you can use, a, a, it's a, like if you may have heard chicken tractors, this is a compost tractor that you can move around your property and then you plant where that compost heap was, but it's building soil for you in situ. So you get you know, more things out of, out of, out of one movement. Did I, did I get everything? Oh my gosh, so amazing. Thank okay. you so much. My mom's <laughs> so gonna be excited. She couldn't come, but I took lots of notes for her. And... Okay, I believe it's recorded so that you can, she can watch it back, so. Oh. That'd be yes. great. It is recorded on fallbrookclimateactionteam.org. Mm -hmm. So be looking for that. We'll get it posted uh, soon after. Okay. 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 Well, with that, we're already at about 745 here. So a lot of great questions, a lot of great information. Diane, thank you so much. As you can see, everyone's very interested and uh, appreciate all the great information you shared. So thank Thanks you so very thank much. You for having me. And go it, we might get a water event this rain this this weekend so get your shovels out and start yeah. making <laughs> start swells, making, making swaths <laughs> catchment basins yeah. and water <laughs> <laughs> very good and everyone make sure to check out um diane's blog on www.vegetarian b-e-g-e t-a-r something i-i-t it's it's t-a-r-i-a-t Dot yeah, com. It's, in the chat. Yeah. it's in the chat yeah or just at google the top of the chat and the end of the chat you can so google thank you so down. much appreciate it once again everybody again we're dark in december so happy holidays to everyone and we'll be back on january 31st at the end of january with the solana center talking about food waste so diane thanks again and everyone thank happy you. holidays thank you Bye -bye.